Take your Bibles and open up with me to Psalm 55. And gentlemen, you can head back to your families if you'd like. Uh, We will take the deacon's offering here in a a moment at the close of the service. But we're going to spend some time in the Word together now. If you're uh, familiar with Fellowship Bible Church, that's why we call it Fellowship Bible Church and not a different kind of church, because we always like to spend some time in the Word and opening the Word together. Um, We've been reading through the Bible together as a church family. If you haven't started that process yet, I'd encourage you to do that. But here's what I want you to think about. Psalm 55, um, I love the Psalms because the Psalms give you kind of a transparent listen to the one who's writing them. There are parts of the Psalms where you're going to say, wow, did he just say that? Did he just say he wished that God would take his enemies out, right? Right? Yeah, and we've all had that thought from time or, t- time or two, depending on how difficult it is. And that's what the psalmist says. But the psalmist always returns, except for one or two occasions, to the end of the psalm by giving God praise, even in spite of the difficulty of his circumstance. Psalm 55 is incredibly difficult, not just because he says, I'm in trouble and my enemies are after me, but because the psalmist senses this element, we're going to talk about that in a moment, where he has been betrayed. Now, when betrayal happens, that is someone we trusted with something all of a sudden turns on us or says something about us or violates a vow or a commitment they made with us. I I don't know. I just don't think there can be any pain that can be as deep as that. What you're about to find out is that David in Psalm 55 acknowledges he's experienced that kind of pain. So um, we're going to read through the psalm together, and then we're just going to kind of unpack it with some ideas for us today. Here we go. Give ear to my prayer, O God, and hide not yourself from my plea for mercy. Attend to me and answer me. I am restless in my complaints, and I moan because of the noise of the enemy, because of the oppression of the wicked. For they drop trouble upon me, and in anger they bear a grudge against me. Here it comes. Here's how he feels. Listen, verse 4. My heart is in anguish within me. The terrors of death have fallen upon me. Fear and trembling come upon me, and horror overwhelms me. And I say, oh, that I had wings like a dove. I would fly away and be at rest. Yes, I would wander far away. I would lodge in the wilderness. Selah. Selah is a a musical pause. It's like what happens when we have a musical interlude here. We're supposed to just pause and think about what we just read. Okay. I would hurry to find a shelter from the raging wind and the tempest. Destroy, O Lord, divide their tongues, for I see violence and strife in the city. Day and night they go around it on its walls, and iniquity and trouble are within it. Ruin is in its midst. Oppression and fraud do not depart from its marketplace. For it is not an enemy who taunts me, then I could bear it. It is not an adversary who deals insolently with me, then I could hide from him. But it is you, a man, my equal, my companion, my familiar friend. We used to take sweet counsel together. Within God's house, we walked in the throng. Let death steal over them. Let them go down to Sheol alive, for evil is in their dwelling place and in their heart. Did you hear it? He, you can hear him wrestling, can't you, with a sense of betrayal. And this is what's in my heart. Verse 16. But I call to God, and the Lord will save me. Evening and morning and noon, I utter my complaint and moan, and he hears my voice. He redeems my soul in safety from the battle that I wage, for many are arrayed against me. God will give ear and humble them. He who is enthroned from of old, Selah, think about that, because they do not change and do not fear God. My companion stretched out his hand against his friends. He violated his covenant. His speech was smooth as butter, yet war was in his heart. His words were softer than oil, yet they were drawn swords. Cast your burden on the Lord, and he will sustain you. He will never permit the righteous to be moved. But you, O God, will cast them down into the pit of destruction. Men of blood and treachery shall not live out half their days, but I will trust in you. You say, Phil, it almost sounded disjointed. Yeah, didn't, didn't it? He's talking, and then he's stopping, then he's talking, then he's stopping. You can almost hear that, and that's often how we are when it feels like everything is crashing down, okay? But no crash, I think, is as significant as the sense of betrayal. There probably is somebody in your life who you sensed, I can't believe they said that about me, 
And sometimes that betrayal we sense without even really following up with a person. So maybe they didn't really say it, but, but we bought into it and we believe it. Whatever the case may be, almost everybody here today knows something like that. So here's some lessons we can learn from it along the way. We often interpret God's apparent inaction as a lack of care. We often interpret God's apparent inaction as a lack of care. You notice it at the beginning of Psalm 55. Let your eye go back there. Give ear to my prayer, O God, and hide not yourself from my plea of mercy. In other words, the psalmist is saying, God, where are you? I'm in trouble. Why are you not paying attention? In fact, verse 2 says that, right? Attend to me and answer me. Don't you hear me complaining? Lord, don't you know how bad it is for me? So often, we tend to interpret God's, now note this, apparent inaction as a lack of care. So let me just give you a couple of just becauses, all right? Let me call these just becauses. Here they are. Here's the first one. Just because you cannot see God acting on your behalf, does that mean he isn't acting on your behalf? Okay. Just because you can't see it, does that mean he isn't? In fact, keep a finger in Psalm 55 and jump back with me to Exodus 14. Exodus 14. Now remember, the Israelites had seen God do some pretty amazing things on their behalf to get them out of Egypt. So you would think these guys have been schooled and what it's like to trust God when things are really difficult. But look at what they say in Exodus 14. Um, Exodus 14, verse, uh, verse 11. Oh, I'll pick up verse 10. When Pharaoh drew near, the people of Israel lifted up their eyes and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them and they feared greatly and the people of Israel cried out to the Lord. Now stop there for a second, okay? Here's the picture. They were set free from Egypt. They came out of there. They had all this gold that the Egyptians had given them because they just said, listen, God said, go ask them um, for their gold earrings and for their gold jewelry. And believe it or not, the Egyptians just gave it up. You say, how is that even possible? I, I like to say, just consider it 400 years of back wages, okay? When you're a slave for 400 years, God says, go ask them for the gold. They gave the gold. Here they are. They've got everything they need, but they come to the Red Sea and the Egyptian army changes, Pharaoh changes his mind, and he's coming down on top of them. So listen how they praise God. This is great, right? Because they trust God because of all the things God has done. So they said to Moses, is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? Right? How can they not praise God? Because they face the difficulty, and immediately they question whether God is caring for them. What have you done to us in bringing us out of Egypt? Is not this what we said to you in Egypt? Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. They're not going to die there. Okay? They are going to die in the wilderness for their complaining, but they're not going to die there. Right? In fact, look at what God is going to do. Then Moses said to the people, Fear not, stand firm to see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. Verse 15, and the Lord said to Moses, um, why do you cry to me? Tell the people of Israel to go forward. Lift up your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it. And the people of Israel may go through the sea on dry ground. Now, just think about this for a second. They'd seen him act in their past, but in that moment of time, he didn't appear to be acting. And look how quickly they went back to saying, God doesn't care about us. Moses, why in the world did you bring us out here? We're gonna die. Just because you cannot see God acting on your behalf, does that mean that he isn't? And of course, the answer to that is what? No, he is working on your behalf. Here's the second just because. Second just because works like this. Just because God isn't working on your timetable, does that mean that he doesn't care? Okay. Now, one of my favorite illustrations of this is found back in the book of Genesis. So go there with me. Genesis 39. Genesis 39, verse 21. For numerously, numerous times in Joseph's life, it says the Lord was with him, the Lord was with him, the Lord was with him. But there is on one occasion where we add the phrase steadfast love in Joseph's life, and it's found here. When he has been um, lied about and cast into prison, he, has been for, he, he will be forgotten about in prison, and he'll spend two years there wondering if he's ever going to get out of prison Verse 21 of Genesis 39. But the Lord was with Joseph, see there's that typical phrase, and showed him steadfast love and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. Just because God wasn't working on Joseph's timetable 
God still expressed to him that he loved him and he cared for him. Now, don't miss that. When we face trials and difficulties and it feels like the world is crashing, we immediately say, it's hard for me to interpret what is God's apparent inaction um, as his care for me. I sense he doesn't care for me. And I want to remind you this morning that even the psalmist cried that out, right? Give ear to my prayer. Lord, where are you? Attend to me. Listen to me. What are you doing? Why are you hiding yourself from me? You hear all of that language. I just want to remind you, just because you cannot see God acting on your behalf, does that mean that he isn't? No. Just because, you, just because God isn't working on your timetable, does that mean that he doesn't care? The answer to that is no. God is working on the timetable that is best for you, not the timetable that you desire the most, right? So that's God's apparent inaction. No, it doesn't say God's inaction. It says God's apparent in action. In fact, the psalmist verifies that when you and I go to sleep tonight, God doesn't slumber or sleep, okay? He's figuring it out. When he's, he's, he's setting in place all the things that are needed for you tomorrow, right? So when you wake up tomorrow, you think it's all about you. It isn't all about you. God's been up all night figuring out how, sovereignly determining how he's gonna work on our behalf for our good and for his glory. Here's the second idea. We are more inclined to make wrong decisions when we are motivated by circumstantial fear. Go back with me to Psalm 55. We are more inclined to make wrong decisions when we are motivated by circumstantial fear. <clears throat> now notice, there's a couple of words that matter here. In the first sentence, the word that mattered was apparent inaction. But here, the word that matters is circumstantial fear. Because we're told to fear the Lord, right? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, we read. But there is a circumstantial fear that you're going to see um, the psalmist cry out right now. Here we find it in Psalm 55. Look at this. My heart is in anguish within me. The terrors of death have fallen upon me. Fear and trembling come upon me, and horror overwhelms me. Okay? Now, that sounds like a guy who's got a fear problem. <clears throat> okay? You thought you had a fear problem? Just look at those words. Anguish, fear, trembling, terrors, horror. Let me unpack those. The word anguish <clears throat> means that you have to keep laboring while you're waiting. Now, now, now that's... That's, that's the one thing we don't want to do. When we're facing something that we're afraid, we'd rather we could just escape it and not have to face it. But sometimes we have to wait and wait and wait and wait and labor through the waiting process. That's the word anguish. How about this word? Terror is a dread to be legitimately frightened. It's the idea that, that this thing isn't just something like someone jumped out, out from behind the door and scared me, right? Um, from time to time, <clears throat> I've kind of outgrown that, but when I first came here as a pastor, I used to do that a lot. Scott, you're the benefit of the benefactor of the fact that I don't do that. With Pastor Jack, almost every time I would walk by his door, I would just randomly bang on it real hard, okay? Just because I like to watch him jump in his chair, okay? <laughs> now, this is totally illegitimate, frightening, okay? I love Jack. I wasn't going to hurt him, but man, did I love scaring him, okay? In fact, one time he had been away, I'm not making this up, he had been away on vacation for a week and I heard him come in the building. Right? And I, I, I said, I'm, I'm gonna scare Jack. And so I ran down into his office and he used to be in an office that didn't have a window and so it was dark in there and I got in behind the door, right? Not making this up. He came in his office, he pushed the door and the door stopped because that's where my feet were, right? And before I reached for the light, he said, hello, Phil, how are you today, okay? <laughs> so... There are times, right, where we can illegitimately feel fear. That's not what this is talking about. This is talking about something that you really should be afraid of. Right? And that's what David is saying. He says, listen, these terrors, these are things that are legitimate. I dread them. Fear, the fear used here, note the word fear in verse 5. Fear and trembling come upon me. Fear is the same fear, the same word, the same Hebrew word that's used to describe the fear of the Lord. So if it's bad fear here, it must be fear of circumstances, not fear of God. Okay? But it's this idea that we are legitimately afraid of our circumstances. Trembling, trembling. Have you ever been so afraid that your body actually reacted physically and you tried to say, stop it? I mean, that's happened to me from time to time where all of a sudden my body is shaking and I'm saying, I don't think I can stop this. I had one of my top five experiences as a pastor um, recently. 
Um, when I, <clears throat> it was an early morning hospital visit, and I, I visited a woman who was going through cancer exploratory surgery. She just recently started coming to the church, and I, I, and I knew she was afraid, and so I went there. And one of the other gentlemen from our church um, was there with us. And we went back into the ER, into the operating room, waiting area. And literally, she was shaking so badly on the, on the gurney that I thought, you know, we probably better get a doctor in here. And she told us, I'm just so afraid, I'm so afraid. I'm afraid of what they're gonna find, I'm afraid of the surgery. And, uh, and God just laid on my heart to just start reading, right? So I opened up Psalm 121, and I started to read a portion of the psalm. And I'm not making this up, I just watched as all of a sudden she wasn't shaking. I just remember stepping out of there saying, I, I just came to be an encouragement and something spiritual just happened there. Right? When you and I are afraid, when we even physically tremble, okay, don't miss this. God is saying that the scriptures themselves can take away some of that trembling. Why? Because we're fearing what we do not know and the truth of God's word washes over us. Here's the last idea. Horror overwhelms me. That same word, uh, overwhelms, is used in, um, in Psalm 78 to describe the sea overwhelming. A number of years ago, we were down at Ocean City, of all places, and uh, it wasn't the season yet, but the water was warm enough you could get in, so there weren't lifeguards there, and we were there with some other friends, and it was a stormy day, <clears throat> and exactly probably what you wouldn't want to do, go into the ocean on a stormy day. And I remember watching a friend of mine who, who's really big and really strong and how that wave crashing in was taller than he was, even though he was just standing like in ankle deep water. The wave coming over just went right over the top of him. And I remember thinking right then, grab the kids, okay? Because I don't want them in this, right? Because if it overwhelms him, it's gonna overwhelm them. Notice here, have you ever been so frightened that you felt overwhelmed? Look what happens to the psalmist when he's in that situation. In fact, notice what he says, verse six. And I say, oh, that I had wings like a dove. I would fly away and be at rest. Yes, I would wander away. I would lodge in the wilderness. The, um, Jeremiah actually references this idea that the dove flies from danger into aloneness, right? In other words, um, sometimes we just want to be alone. The result of circumstantial fear for the psalmist was he said, I want to run and hide. I want to run and hide. Now, some of you are wired in such a way that when you're afraid, you want to fight. But the bulk of people are wired in such a way that when the fear gets too great, they just want to run and hide. I started to kind of think about that today. What does it mean to say, I want to get to the wilderness, I just want to put it away from me? You want to pretend that the struggle or the challenge isn't there. See, the dove in his home would have said, here's where I need to be, but I'm gonna run, I'm gonna fly to the wilderness, I just wanna get out of here because here it's dangerous. I just was thinking about that. What are some ways we pretend it isn't there? We can pretend it isn't there physically, mentally, socially. Let me give you physically. Physically, we can pretend it isn't there by simply in either going someplace where it's not or we can even stay in the same geographical location and imbibe drugs or alcohol or something else that causes us for a moment to pretend it isn't there. You can pretend it isn't there physically. You can pretend it isn't there mentally, okay? Just think about this for a second. You can fill your mind with distractions so you don't have to think about it. You're just like the dove in Psalm 55, flying away. Why do you think you can spend so much time either maybe just on your phone or in social media or watching movies or TV binging when you have other issues and other problems you should be dealing with. It doesn't even make any sense except for the fact that mentally you are pretending it isn't there. Eventually, you can even pretend socially it isn't there. You can become real good at whatever you were afraid of when you come in and someone reaches for your hand and you came in today feeling a great burden and this is the one place you could have shared it, right? And someone reaches for their hand and they say, hello, how are you today? And you reach for their hand and you say what? Fine. But you're not really fine, are you? See, you're pretending it isn't there socially. All of this fear that's going on inside, we escape it physically, mentally, socially just 
like the psalmist said, yes, I would wander far away. I would lodge somewhere else. I would hurry and find shelter from the raging wind and tempest. I'd want to get away from the one thing that frightens me. We all have a tendency to want to run. Okay, let's come back to the psalm for a second. Because here's this idea. We are likely to be hurt more deeply the closer the relationship of betrayal. Okay. We are likely to be hurt more deeply the closer the relationship of betrayal. In fact, you're going to hear the psalmist say that. Look, um, verse 12. For it is not an enemy who taunts me, that I could bear. It is not an adversary who deals insolently with me, that I could hide from, then I could hide from him. He's saying, listen, if it was somebody I didn't know, it wouldn't be so hard. But this betrayal is great. Okay? And I don't know... Well, I think David does know why it happened. But this betrayal is great. And because of this betrayal, the one person who I trusted has hurt me. Hmm. Now, we don't know who this individual is, okay? The Bible doesn't reveal to us who it is, but I think, and scholars agree, that there are some hints at who this person could have been in the text. For instance, we find words in this text like... Um, we used to take sweet counsel together. That is, that maybe this person was a counselor of David's. He talks about him being an equal or a companion or a familiar friend, someone he was familiar with. He talks about him going into God's house, and they walked in the throng worshiping God. He talks about all of that. So let me think with you about this. Maybe, just maybe, um, this could have been Ahithophel, who was David's counselor. I gotta tell you a bit of a story about Ahithophel, but I think it'll cause you to understand betrayal a little differently. Here we go. Now in those days, the counsel that Ahithophel gave was as if one consulted the word of God. So was all the counsel of Ahithophel esteemed, both by David and by Absalom. Now, the fact that Ahithophel's in this sentence with David and Absalom, remember, Absalom's the son who attempted the coup to, throw over, to overthrow his father's kingdom, right? So he killed the younger brother, then he came back, then he came back um, because his father wasn't taking, dealing with the situation properly. He took it in his own hands. Then he came back. One of the saddest stories is the story of Absalom. He didn't live in Jerusalem because he, because he knew that his father knew that he'd killed his younger brother for ra raping his stepsister. So it, it's a sad story, right? But here's the thing. David did invite him back, but then David didn't talk to him. Like this is so typically a man-dad thing. There was the problem. He brought him back to Jerusalem, and he didn't talk to him for two years. Here's David. Here's Absalom coming back to Jerusalem, figuring this is a good scenario. This is a really nice scenario. Maybe Dad's going to maybe Dad's going to address me. Maybe he's going to deal with me. Maybe he's going to he's going to maybe I can get restitution. But he comes back, and for two years, Dad doesn't say a thing. Right? And Absalom's bitterness starts to grow, and eventually, Absalom decides he's going to overthrow the kingdom. So he sets it up so that he can overthrow the kingdom. And as he begins to overthrow the kingdom, David and his wives and the rest of the family and a few of his uh, closest uh, confidants, they all leave the city because Absalom is coming in and he's going to run it. Okay? This guy by the name Ahithophel shows up. Ahithophel was one of David's best counselors. In fact, here the text tells us what? That when he spoke, it was like the word of God. So all of the counsel, not just some of it, but all of it, everything Ahithophel said made sense to David. He trusted Ahithophel immensely. But Ahithophel flips the switch and doesn't go with David. He stays back and works with Absalom. And then what he says is really staggering. Okay? Then what he says is, listen, here's what I want you to do. I'll give you counsel, Absalom. And Absalom says, okay, I'll take your counsel. You were my father's counselor. You should be mine. So here's the first thing I want you to do. I want you to put tents on top of the palace, and I want you to go up there and sleep with all of his concubines. Okay. Well, well, what? Yeah, that's what I want you to do. And secondly, I want to make an arrangement whereby we will go now, right now, and we'll pursue David, who's fleeing from the city. We'll get him while he's not expecting it. I will terrorize the living daylights out of him, and then I'm going to kill him. I'll send everybody else away, and I'll personally kill him. Right? Just think about that. Talk about the ultimate betrayal. This was your closest counselor. In fact, 
One writer captures it this way. King's David trusted counselor who turned traitor and joined Absalom's conspiracy. This is Ahithophel. He advised Absalom to take over the royal harem. Taking possession of the harem was a public act declaring a former king to be deceased and replaced. Since David was still alive, the act was meant to bring about a final cleavage between David and Absalom. David had taken another man's wife in secret. His own wives would now, concubines, would now be taken from him in public. That last sentence really matters. Just tuck that away, okay? David was on the palace roof when he looked down at Bathsheba, right? And Ahithophel says, hey, take those wives, his concubines, up on the palace roof and sleep with them up there so that all the world may know that you're the king and your father means nothing. You say, wow, that's harsh. Look at this. Ahithophel's second stratagem, strategy was to attack David quickly with 12,000 elite troops. Absalom rejected this advice, however, and accepted a counter suggestion by Hushea. David's spy in Absalom's palace. When Ahithophel saw that his counsel was not followed, he went to his hometown and hanged himself. You say, wow, talk about a bitter guy. Why is he so bitter? That's a great question. Let me introduce you to two other passages that you may not have noticed before. Back in 2 Samuel 23, we read this, just in a list of names. It almost flies by us. Eliphalat, the son of Anishbi of Mekah. Eliam, the son of Ahithophel. So Ahithophel had a son, and the son's name was Eliam. Look what uh, 2 Samuel 11 says. And David sent and inquired about the woman. This is Bathsheba. And one said, is not this Bathsheba the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? We think of her as the wife of Uriah the Hittite that we forget that she had a father. Let me tell you something about Eliam. Eliam was one of the 37 mighty men of David. He was like one of the guys. Okay? When David went to war, he took his mighty men with him. Eliam was one of those guys. He's the guy who went. He's the guy who stood up. He's the guy who fought for the king. He's the one who was valiant for the king. In fact, there is a possibility that Eliam actually named his daughter. Her name wasn't Firth Bathsheba. That was changed. Her name was Firth Beth Bethsha which actually meant um, this idea that, <clears throat> that she was of her father's prosperity. In other words, a daughter is born to Eliam, and he says, man, David has been so good to me. I had to call this daughter Bethsha, which means she is born into my prosperity. But her father possibly changed her name to Bathsheba, which means not daughter of my prosperity, but daughter of the covenant, probably when she was bar mitzvah. That was kind of the, the, the she reached that age of 13, where she would have suddenly stepped up into womanhood and the father says, listen, I'm gonna change your name. It's no longer gonna be Bethsha, which means you were born in my prosperity. I am so encouraged by your spiritual maturity that I'm gonna call you Bathsheba, which is the daughter of God's covenant. Wow, just let that settle in for a moment. I go back and look at the text again. That's Eliam. He is... Bathsheba's father, if Ahithophel is Bathsheba's not father, then but hit her. <laughs> Closest counselor David ever had, told him everything. He didn't tell him one thing. He didn't tell him that he was sleeping with his granddaughter. Wow. Now I know that most betrayal when it takes place, feels like we are, and there are circumstances, that we are fully the victim. We didn't see it coming, we didn't know it was coming, but there are times, and I think David was in this confusion stage too, where when someone betrays us, our mind starts to say, and what did you do, right? And here's part of the truth about what's going on with this betrayal. I'm gonna give you a sum of, and I'm gonna give you an all of. Here's the sum of, sum of. Some of the messes you clean up are messes of your own making. Now, I know there are situations, that's why I said some of, where you were betrayed and you were totally the victim. There are some times that you weren't. David was betrayed by Ahithophel, and if he would have thought about it for a little bit, he would have understood why. And probably he did think about it a little bit, like when he's keeping it a secret from Uriah. I mean, just go back and think about this. <laughs> Maybe you're a parent or a grandparent that's been to a wedding recently. Can you imagine being a Hithophel? Rejoicing in the wedding of your daughter who is marrying a loyal military man. 
you're there, you're rejoicing, you're thankful for Uriah the Hittite, you're grateful for his commitment to the nation of Israel. And, and, and you're thinking, this is the daughter of the covenant. And then you find out through the rumor mill that the king is sleeping with somebody. And then you find out that it's the daughter of the covenant, the daughter of the oath, the daughter who was to keep her covenants. Wow. Some of the messes you clean up are messes of your own making. Before you and I say, I can't believe somebody else treats me that way, we ought to stop. Just like Luke 17 says, consider your own sin first before you go and address somebody else's sin. Think what you might have done. That's part of where David is here. But let me give you what he gets right in Psalm 55. Here's what he gets right. In all of these discussions, he doesn't choose to take it into his own hands. And that's the all of all of the wrongs done against you will ultimately be judged by God. Ahithophel is without excuse for what he's attempting to do to David, without excuse. David should acknowledge that, hey, some of it's the mess I made, right? But Ahithophel is still without excuse, and David, as the king, could have attempted to take it into his own hands, but he doesn't. Instead, he says over and over again, but you, O God, verse 23, will cast them down into the pit of destruction. Um, I will have to trust in you. You will bring about the judgment. This is the quickest way, frankly, to overcome the bitterness that probably is that you're stuck with as an issue of your betra betrayal. If you're growing bitter, you just need to take a step back and say, it's not mine to do, it's God's. It's not mine to do, it's God's. And that is why God says over in Romans 12, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Never take your own revenge. Leave room for the discipline or the wrath of God. The picture is this. We've all in some way, shape, or form been betrayed. S to, to release that, you've got to say, that's God's to deal with. I'm not saying you shouldn't seek to make amends. I'm just saying that even that same passage in Romans 12 says, if possible, as much as it's when you live at peace with all men, what I am saying is that there are some things that do not resolve. Right? And when they don't resolve, our hope is in the fact that God ultimately will make it right. That's what he says here. All of the wrongs done against you will ultimately be judged by God. Listen, if there's some issues in your life, relationships that have fallen apart, and some of that mess is of your own making, I'm just gonna tell you, humble yourself, go and make right what's your part. See, Phil, it's too late. If you're living and breathing, they're living and breathing, it's not too late. You say, I've already done it. Then you've done what you can do. And you leave the room for God to do what he will do. But if you haven't done it, then I'm just gonna encourage you again, take the ownership for what your part is. David says, man, I was betrayed by a guy who should have been my closest confidant. Yes, you were. And yes, you did something horrendously wrong, king, which brought about as well his response. Here's the final idea. We are able, by God's grace, to endure great difficulties if we cast them on the Lord. I love this. We are able, by God's grace, to endure great difficulties if we cast them on the Lord. We often interpret God's apparent inaction as a lack of care, first thing. Here's the second idea. We are more inclined to make wrong decisions when we are motivated by circumstantial fear. Third idea. We are likely to be hurt more deeply the closer the relationship of betrayal, like someone who we really, really trusted. Here's the last idea. We are able, by God's grace, to endure great difficulties if we cast them on the Lord. In fact, we find that same idea not only here, at the very end of the psalm, cast your burden on the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never permit the righteous to be moved. But we also find it in 1 Peter 5, 7, casting all your anxieties upon him because he cares for you. The word casting there is like you're taking off a jacket and you're casting it, you're throwing it somewhere else. Now, um, yesterday, we were taking down this tree in our backyard, which was like a friend of mine just reminded me this morning when I told him, you know, we, we were new at this. My son and I were doing this together, and we, we had a chainsaw. We figured that was enough. Okay, it was a very big tree. So there was a time where I actually had the car cabled to the top of the tree, okay, because I was a little concerned that when we cut, it might fall like on the neighbor's house or something like that. And, and he smiled, and he said, you know, the Internet's full of YouTube videos that look like that, right? There's a lot of danger there, okay? But God was gracious and, uh, and takes care of, a friend of mine used to say, God takes care of fools and babies and I'm not a baby, okay? So that's it. So here's the thing. The tree came down perfectly and then we started to cut it up. And I'm telling you what, there were logs that were massive, right? 
and I'm trying to lift those, and, and I'm glad I have a son who's younger than me, okay? I would not think that I could just carry that log around all day long. The log is meant to be lifted and cast aside. If I walked in here this morning just carrying a bunch of logs, you'd say, Pastor Phil, what is wrong with you? Maybe the same thing that is wrong with all of us when we receive a burden or something we're anxious about and we insist on carrying it all day long. The idea is this, both in the psalmist's mind as well as in Peter's mind, cast your burden on the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never permit the righteous to be moved, casting all your anxieties on him. See it? Because he cares for you. You say, how do I do that? Simply tell him. Say over and over again, Lord, this burden is yours. Help me live in light of the truth that this burden is yours. Go back with me to Psalm 55 and we'll wrap it up right here. Look. Notice how he started the psalm? He said, listen, uh, where are you, Lord? You're not listening. I'm talking, but could you pay attention down here? Verse 16. But I call the Lord. Now listen how confident he gets. And the Lord will save me. Evening and morning and at noon, I utter my complaint and moan. And he hears my voice. He redeems my soul in safety from the battle that I wage, for many are arrayed against me. Circumstances haven't changed, but God's going to redeem me. Verse 19. God will give ear and humble them. He he is enthroned from of old. Wow. So you'll think about that. There's your picture. Whatever your anxieties, whatever your burdens, the way you cast them on the Lord is to speak to the Lord and remind yourself that he will do what he said he will do. And then, if you're gonna pick it up again, pick it up only to cast. Back into prayer to the Lord. If you're gonna pick it up again, pick it up only to cast. Don't pick it up to carry it. Or else you can expect to get weary. And you can expect to be spiritually discouraged. I'm gonna invite the, um, oh, we're closing with a special number this morning, which is great. Um, so, Bibi, if you want to come, and the gentlemen who want to come to uh, to take the deacon's offering, we always do that on the Sundays we have communion. Okay, just listen to me real quickly before we go. So, we're going to close with just this number this morning, reminding us of the greatness of God. That in spite of our troubles, in spite of our anxieties, we can cast our cares in the Lord because of the greatness of God. Greatness of God. The deacon's offering that we take this morning goes to those who have uh, immediate needs within our fellowship and without. So I encourage you to give graciously. We only do this once a month. But give for those who are in need this morning. All of those funds go directly to those who are in need. Will you bow your heads with me? Maybe this morning you came in with a sense of pain and betrayal. Maybe you've been hiding from something you've been afraid of. I just want to encourage you to don't keep doing that. It's not the way God designed it. He designed for you to cast your cares on him. He designed for you to be honest with those brothers and sisters in Christ who really do want to help you. If you have a sense of betrayal, someone who's betrayed you, I would just pause, encourage you to pause and say, ask yourself, is any of this, I'm not saying it is, but is any of this a result of your own doing? Take a moment and ponder that. If it is, then humble yourself and make that right. If it isn't, then continue to cast your cares upon the Lord. Know this, that God will make it right. He will make it right. Father, we rejoice. We can sing of your greatness, even though we struggle sometimes to grasp or fully understand how you're working and what you're doing. We can sing of your greatness and we can believe it. We can sing of your care and we can believe it. We can remember that you and you alone control all things and control, Lord, the events of our life. Tomorrow morning you prepared them for us. Help us live and say with the psalmist, I will trust in the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.